Hello, welcome to the December 22nd, 2023 Club Cubase live stream. My name is Greg Undo and I'm the host of the live stream. If you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could submit questions in advance by emailing clubcubase at steinberg.de or you can uh, simply ask the questions in the live chat field. When asking questions, if you could uh, specify which version of Cubase that you're running, also, so if it's 11, 12, 13, which level? So if it's Cubase LE, AI, Elements, Artist, or Pro, uh, and which operating system? Um, that information is always helpful to have. Um, so if you can specify that, if we should have, we'll probably have a lot of questions that I won't be able to answer kind of immediately. Um, so if you don't see an immediate response to your question, if we could just, uh, if you could just wait uh, and avoid asking the same question repeatedly, that would be appreciated. Um, we'll go through all of the questions chronologically in time. So just, just a quick heads up with that. Um, we should have an index of all the topics that are covered in today's live stream that will be pinned to the top of the comments field several hours after the live stream ends. So later tonight, I'll take a dinner break after our Zoom social meetup and the live stream and then get the comments posted. And if you wanted to search for more than 30,000 topics that have been posted, you could go to cubaseindex.com. We want to thank Jan from Stockholm for creating that site. We also want to give special thanks to Agent K and Jazz Dude who serve as moderators. They're not Steinberg employees. They just want to make it a better community. So we appreciate their efforts. And we'll also give a special thanks to Jazz Dude for all of his time and effort into the Cubase Nation Discord, which is a wonderful resource of information for the Steinberg community. This will be the last live stream for the year, so we'll be taking time off for the holidays uh, next week, but we will resume on January 2nd. Uh, so once again, my name is uh, Greg Undo. I work for Yamaha Corporation of America. I primarily focus on Steinberg products, and I'm the host today. I'm presenting from just outside of Washington, D.C. area in the United States in Alexandria, Virginia. If you're watching this live, please feel free to, uh, you know, f please feel free to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. So just if, in case anyone is interested, we have a couple. I just was looking at kind of the year in live stream. So just pulled up a couple of statistics uh, if anyone's interested. So in, and this isn't counting today or we have another nine days to go, but uh but we'll have 318 hours of live streams. We'll have answered 7,100. We've answered 7,158 topics with 2,009,234 views and 2,563,685 hours of the live streams have been viewed this year with 33,272,425 impressions. So I just want to give a special thanks to everyone that's participated in the live streams. And I'm just grateful for everyone that's taken the time to be a part and to create such a wonderful community. So I appreciate that. So with that, we will go ahead and start answering questions. Uh, I posted the link for the Zoom meetup uh, in the chat field. I'll try to do that about every 30 minutes. Uh, but let me know. Um, you, you, you so we'll try to do that. We'll start that at like at about uh, one, hour, one hour and 55 minutes from now. So just a quick heads up with that. It's just a great way to kind of meet people who are on the live streams. Uh, I look forward to it every month. All right. So we have a question from Sky Warrior. Um, how to put several drum pads from Groove Agent into different channels in the mixer? Thanks. Okay, so there's kind of different approaches depending on if you're in a beat agent or a acoustic agent. So let's say if I have uh, my beat agent and I'm playing back, uh, we can see all of our different, everything's being mixed out to stereo outs here. So I'm gonna select Let's say my snare and clap. And let's say if I want to send these to output two. So I think if we had those selected at the same time, if we hold down the shift key, we can just change the output. So let's say if I want to send my hi-hat to output three, I could just click here. So we go to the instrument tab to edit. 
to the main and then you could see the outputs and as we add those particular outputs we can now just come over and we'll solo so we just have the hi-hats isolated and the clap and snare and the rest of the drums which i think is in this case is just the kick and maybe a little reverb and if we click on the little on the instrument track we get exposed to different tracks right here now if this was going to be for an acoustic agent it would be slightly different so let's say we'll do it for an acoustic agent so i'll remove this track and we'll just start it from scratch we'll add an instrument track do a groove agent se uh, and now we'll load up just a an acoustic kit okay so we'll just come over here let's say we'll play the pattern so now everything is going out of one stereo out and what i would do at this point is go to, on an acoustic agent go to the mixer and once we see the mixer once we click at the top i could say i want my snare to go out of output two my hi-hat out of output three stereo out four for my overheads and let's say my rooms on stereo output five and now these will all be kind of broken down to their individual tracks so it's a slightly different method to kind of break out to individual outs whether it's a an acoustic agent kit where we kind of see the actual drums like a virtual drummer or if it's going to be more of like an MPC style beat agent kit. All right, so we see a question from Ness. Uh, where is the exclusive expanded rack in the mixer window in, in Cubase 13 and Cubase 12 is the upper right hand corner in one of the taps, thanks. Okay, so I'll just add a bunch of audio tracks here. Okay, and let's go to our mixer. All right, so I want to say, Let's just see if it's so if you just kind of right click in the particular zones here, uh, then you can say expand sections exclusively. So now when I go to pre, to inserts, to my channel strip, so just right click in the rack zone itself. And so now I could have multiple ones active, or we could just, again, right click and we'll see the expand sections exclusively. So as I come here, only one is open at a time so let me know if that helps ness all right so we see uh from west star audio says hi greg best wishes and thank you for the excellent live stream throughout the year merry christmas thank you very much all right we have aul checking in from switzerland we have matt elston on all right and we have uh rachel checking in from quebec thanks for being on the live stream today all right, and we see Stefan from Sweden. And we see Jan from Cubase Index. Always great to see Jazz Dude on. All right, and we have the artist known as Love checking in, who's usually in New York, but he's in Brazil for Christmas. Thanks for joining us while you're on, uh, while you're in Brazil. Hope you have a wonderful trip. Always wanted to go there. All right, and we have Sends1 sending love from Phoenix. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Rachel asks, um, where can I configure the racks for the mix console? I'm using Cubase Pro 13, thanks. Okay, so once we uh, come over here in the upper right-hand corner, this is where we could pick and choose which components 
that we want to see visible in the racks. So it's kind of like the little setup window. So go to the far upper right hand corner here and then you could pick and choose kind of, you know, if you want the left zone, the right zone in the mixer and which components within the racks that you want to see. So again, just come over here, upper right hand corner, click, and then you could pick and choose what components you want to see right there. Okay. All right, so we have uh, Renee asks, uh, I've customized many presets in Halion Sonic 7, but in the right side panel, F6, uh, the user content is empty. How do I get my presets to be visible in the user content? All right, so let's come over here. I'll just load up a Halion and we'll save a preset. So we'll come over here. Let's go to Halion Sonic 7. All right, let's say I'll now modify. All right, so now I want to modify this. We'll just come over here. We'll choose save preset. So at this point, we'll call it Renee. We'll hit OK. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and let's look. Go to our media to user presets. And we'll say, let's go to our instrument presets. And then we'll just see Renee right there. So I'm just going to drag this out, which will open up. So as soon as we come over here, then we could see that this particular preset is recalled and will match what we had set for this particular instrument as well. So we'll see kind of the identical settings I just did. So make sure that you look uh, when you go into Media Bay um, that you go directly. And so if we want to and you said F6, but it's probably F5 maybe. So let's look in the big media bay. So when I look into the big media bay, we would go to user content to, um, I think, VST3 to Steinberg. Let's see if it's... And we see our Halion Sonic. And then I could just see the preset that we just created there. So let me know if you're doing something differently, Renee, with that, um, or if that makes sense. All right, so we see Mark Jillian on. Just saying thank you. You're welcome. All right, uh, always great to see uh, Uno Memento from Finland. Hope you're doing well. Very loyal attendee. Appreciate you being online today. All right, uh, so we see from Renee, it just says, uh, in Cubase 12's Mix Console, I can drag and drop the insert header to another channel to copy all inserts in one go. Uh, this is not possible in Cubase 13. Is there a preference that enables this feature? All right, so let's take a look. Um, so let me just come over here. Let's say I'll get to audio four and I'll just go to be like an audio track preset and drag these over. So we'll populate some inserts. So we go to our mix console. Uh, let's look at our inserts. Okay, so I think that if we... Let me just make this just a little wider so we can... I think that there might be... Let me just... I think 
back in 12 it was something this but you could always copy and paste the inserts but let me just So there we can do one at a time. Let's, we don't want that. We want to, I'll just try it in the lower zone mixer because we can see it a little easier. All right, so what, what I just did here um, in the lower zone mixer is I just kind of drag and then you could drop like that. So let's see if we do this with the full screen mixer. If I just kind of take, yeah, so if we just go to the bottom area here, I could just drag my inserts from that channel over to another channel. So let me know if that makes sense and works for you. All right, so we have uh, Fabrizio saying, wishing everyone a happy holiday season from Paris, France. Thanks for joining us today. All right, and we have uh, Mark Medor checking in from Little Rock, Arkansas. I got to go to Little Rock once, beautiful city. All right, great to see Val from Vienna. All right, so we see uh, Dal Saru just asks, um, says when your settings are at 32-bit float, the channel faders are at 32, uh, but the input master fader is still at 24, meaning they can't be clipped. So you could think of it that way. I mean, the it's still going to kind of write a 24-bit word. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to capture a 24-bit word, but if you have additional effects on it, then it's not going to... Uh, everything since the audio engine could be either in 32-bit or 64-bit floating point that you could translate uh, so everything that you kind of um, do will be at the higher within floating point until it leaves the the converter and then it's going to be at 24-bit at that point. And great to see Tim Weinheimer on and he just updated Cubase 13 today sounds like a good self Christmas gift. Hope you enjoy it. Hope you can hope we will see you on the youth uh, Zoom social meetup. All right, so we see uh from Andy Andy Racks the Cams ask, uh is USB data a common problem in doll recording? I'm using a second PC to control GUI-based apps for numerous synth-based hardware items. Uh, MIDI is main PC running Cubase, uh, but GUI is on PC2. Um, so I'm not sure how you're uh, routing the MIDI with the, you know, but you could definitely send, uh, so to control GUI-based apps or numerous synth. So, you know, I'm not sure if you're using like a specific tool like VST System Link or something like VE Pro to kind of host the other systems. You know, so VST System Link will use a digital audio connection. Uh, VE Pro will generally use, um, I believe, Ethernet for the data transmission. So I don't know. So if you could let us know which, uh, what kind of hosting scenario that you're using for for hosting on the second PC that could be helpful for us okay so we see attracted to the metal like Magneto saying hello to everyone all right we see a message from um, Giuseppe but about a password but maybe if you could get it translated to English that'd be helpful sorry for my ignorance of different languages 
All right, uh, so we have a question. Um, hi from Germany. How can I use the control room effectively in a home studio environment? Thanks. So there's a lot of great uses for, for the control room, like even for home or if you're just utilizing uh, with, you know, a like an audio interface that's just going to output um, like to two stereo outs. Let me just open up a quick project here. All right, so what the control room is going to allow you to do is to kind of have just a separate monitoring path that doesn't affect the gain structure of your mix. So let's say we're here and I can see kind of my master fader here. So a lot of people will treat their master fader what did you say? kind of as their monitoring volume. And this could affect kind of like when you go to export an audio mix down. So we can see that on my master fader, if this is down, that we have kind of very little uh, output signal that's going on. So maybe we just want to use this for monitoring. So what I could do now is just come over and have this as just my monitoring level without affecting the gain structure of the mix console. If we wanted to, you know, to dim to listen to our levels and we could set kind of different dim amounts if we click on the main tab here how much you want it to dim down we could also set kind of a known monitoring level so if we come here we could say i'm going to hold down the alt or option key and now i could just come over here and go to my known monitoring point at this point, we could also say, let's get to like our down mix presets. So if I want to listen to this in stereo or mono. Or in stereo. Now there's also kind of a monitoring path. So if we have uh, like software that does room correction for reverbs, or room correction, something like maybe like sonar works that you don't want it applied to the file uh, when you export audio mix down, but you want it in the monitoring path. We could place plugins here so that if you're correcting like you know sonic deficiencies in your monitoring environment, that you know, those sonic deficiencies aren't applied into the rendered file. It's just going to be on playback. Uh, you also have the capability of, let's say we have our effects here. So I want to solo, let's say my reverb. And when I solo the reverb, it also solos the source file. But now what we could do is have a listen bus. So I could, I could come over and let's say I want to take first component of the listen bus. Is I could, instead of just soloing, and muting everything, I could click on the L button and everything else will get dimmed down. And we can set the listen dim amount here. So if I still want to hear it in context, but I want the vocals. And often when we have effects, so I solo the effects, this could solo the source. So if I would come here, we could say, okay, I want to go to my... But if I wanted to just hear the reverb itself, I could just come here. And now I'm not hearing the source, I'm just isolating the reverb. And there's also uh, ability to have reference tracks. Uh, so if you wanted to take like a reference track and have that route it to a QSend, you could do that without having to have the reference go through your master fader. So those are just a couple things you could do with the control room in like a home studio environment that could be really, be really beneficial. All right, wonderful to see John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin.
All right. Um, so we see from uh, Watch Addicts 12, uh, it says, uh, my question, uh, as I log in at Steinberg, I see that I'm registered uh, owning Cubase 12 Pro. And let me see if there's maybe a second follow-up question with that. Um, so yeah, if you see that you have Cubase 12 Pro, you can, if it's a question about updating to ver you know, version 13, you could do that as well. Uh, but let me know. Um, so uh, it says, I'm re okay, sorry. It says I'm registered as running Cubase 12 Pro. Meanwhile, I'm running 11 Pro on my Mac. I haven't paid for 12, but was refunded. Uh, ready now, may I, st may I still pay for 12 Pro? Um, so I, 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 so I'm not, you know, it could be that maybe you don't have your license and you might have to update to version 13 because Cubase 12 is uh, not the current version, so you can't buy the non-current version. But if you update it to, um, from your Cubase 11 Pro on your Mac to 13, you could run versions 13 and 12 using the Steinberg licensing and use... Uh, your USB e licensor for Cubase 11 and earlier. All right, so we have uh, MyNAC asks um, how to overcome a clip becomes highlighted while playback, which is difficult to edit other clips on the same track or on other tracks in Cubase 13. This was not there in earlier versions of Cubase. So probably what it is, um, let's say if I come here to this track, there's a preference. So let's go to your preferences. Uh, and then if you go to editing, there's an, a preference that says uh, auto select events under cursor. So go to preferences, editing, and let me know if it looks like this. So while a track is playing, if I have this track selected, and then as soon as the cursor comes to this point, this event will get highlighted. And when the cursor is over this event, so as we go, and as the cursor hits this particular event, it's gonna highlight that event. So if you if that's the behavior, if you want that to stop, just go to preferences to editing and choose auto select events under cursor. And it's a it's a great feature, like if you have a control surface. So if you wanted to do editing uh, with a control surface, what you could do is as you move over, that could automatically select the events that you don't have to physically select with the mouse when you're doing editing on a control surface. So let me know if that's up, if that is helpful for that. All right. All right, wonderful to see you, Brian from Beulahville, North Carolina. Very loyal attendee. Glad you can make it here. All right, so uh, Qtrax100 asks, uh, Cubase 12, Windows 10, uh, best way for audio that drifts on and off the grid. I have stuff digitized from tape a few decades old. So if you have a scenario like that, there's a couple ways you could do it. If you wanted to do it manually, uh, many people do that using the Time Warp tool. So I'll just import a quick file here just to kind of show this. Okay, so let's say we're looking at this particular file here. And I turn on the click and it's, let's say it's not following the click. So what you can do is if you want to, let's just grab, I'll add a tempo track. So if you want to do it kind of manually, um, what you could do is just come over and say, okay, we want this probably, 
say this as maybe a pickup note. So if you want to do it manually, what you could do is I'm just going to kind of visually line up the waveform here so that the downbeat is kind of starting. And we can say, okay, I'm going to listen to this. And we'll say, okay, measure. So we will switch to our warp grid. And what this is going to allow us to do is I'll set my transport mode behavior here. And I'll say, okay, let's move. Let's say our, we're going to go to the next part. And we're going to now just move measure three to be right there. And measure four. Now, if we don't want to do this manually, what we could do is I'm just going to select the event. So again, we have no correlation between the click and what's going on. And this probably the tempo is fluctuating like real musicians. We go to our project window, choose tempo detection, we'll analyze. And now when we go back, listen to it, it's, it's created a tempo track for us automatically. And now we can say it gives us a signature track and we don't assume that all music is in four, four. So it, it calculates the beat. So I'm going to go to my signature track and we'll put a four, four in right there. And now we have the tempo map that's been extracted from the actual performance. So that's all you have to do with that. So give that a try. And if at this point, if you go, okay, I, you know, so if you're doing a remix, uh, just kind of, let's say if I wanted to take like a drum loop, so we'll come over. All right, so now I could drag this drum loop into the project. I'm going to start it at the downbeat here. And I'll just hit J, so it's gonna to snap to the event. And then I could place this uh, into musical mode. And now, So this loop is now following the tempo. Now if we look at the tempo, we can say we're fluctuating from like 124 to 130, roughly. And if I wanted to, I could also just take this particular track. So we see that we have our tempo map here. I could take this particular track. Let's go to audio. Let's go to advanced and we'll say set definition from tempo. And we could do this in the project or apply it to the file. And once we do that, we'll see that we see this little icon appear in the upper right hand corner of the WAV file. If you have multiple tracks, you could just do that. And now if I wanted this to play back at a steady tempo instead of fluctuating, I could just go to my tempo map and say it's played at 126. So now the tracks are playing back, the original track is playing back at a perfectly steady tempo. So if you wanted the events to follow the natural contours of the music, you could do that. Or if you wanted the music itself to be perfectly steady, you could do that as well. All right, well, always wonderful to see Razel checking in from Denmark. All 
All right, so Gary Ward asks, um, sorry, let me just jump up. Chat field just jumped. Um, Gary Ward asks, I have Cubase 12 Pro on my desktop, no dongle. Can I put Cubase 12 on my, on my laptop, perhaps by using the old dongle? So it won't work with the old dongle, but with Cubase 12, you could authorize up to three different computers. So you could have your laptop and your desktop both authorized with the same license. So you don't need to take the... Uh, you can have both of them. So once you install it, you go to the Steinberg Activation Manager and activate it on your laptop. And then you can have Cubase 12 running in both locations. All right. So we see from Qtrax 100, it says the amount of stuff Greg knows about Cubase is incredible. So I've just encountered more mistakes before other people and have learned from them, hopefully. All right. Wonderful that Peter could make it from Montreal. All right. All right, we see Vishnu on from India. Thanks for joining us. So we see from uh, Minax says, thanks a lot, Greg. You made my Christmas a lot red. So. All right, uh, so we have a question from Quellen. Um, hello, Greg. Is there a way to undo some plugin edits? For example, uh, how can't I undo a boost of IDB and bring it back where it was before, not remembering the exact position? Control Z doesn't work on that. So if we come over here, let's say if I take this particular track, I move the fader, I come over here, I adjust the EQ, let's load up a plug-in like a uh, black valve and I make an adjustment here and I make more adjustments in a particular plug-in. So we do this. So we could think of control or command Z as doing the uh, undos for edits. But if we hit alt or option plus Z and we could just access it right here as well uh, in the mix console, now we have a separate undo history for just like mixing and plug-in settings. So let's just come over here and we can see that now we can redo all my changes. So again, I'll try Alt or Option plus Z and that will undo. That's like a separate mix console history. And if you're in a full screen mixer, and just look at your mix console history here. You can just kind of go right back to where you were. So try Alt or Option plus Z, and that will undo your mix console history. Okay, so we see um, uh, Sawin Swing just says, hello, sir. Thanks for a nice video, so you're welcome. Always great to see Captain Energy Music on. Wishing everyone Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And it says it doesn't want to miss the pre-holiday season live with one of the best communities on the web, so. Thanks to your email, I was able to get that passed on to the Cubasis team. All right. Um, so we see from um, from Minac uh, Banerjee asks a difference in signal flow in any tracks and master fader. Um, also, can we add more than one master fader? irrespective of sound card. So we can think of the master fader as just kind of like, you know, at this point it leaves the software domain to your audio interface or converter. So if you have, you know, three or if you have eight outputs, you could have all these being, you know, all of the stereo outs kind of going out in parallel. If you wanted to, if you had your particular tracks going. Um, so, you know, but they may not, you, you know, if you had like master processing, so let's say if you had kind of like a mastering, uh, 
processing chain here with like you know frequency that you know those wouldn't carry over uh you know so you know everything that you're hearing kind of out of your speakers would generally be like a single master what a lot of people do if they wanted different flavors is to send the tracks to groups and then multiple groups those groups can be routed to individual outputs but the groups can also be routed to the master output if you need it to process uh, the tracks independently all right i'm gonna go ahead and paste the uh, club cubase the zoom meetup hopefully everyone can see the password this time all right, oh, um, all right, I see that I've been, uh, we see Q-Trax says, great Christmas gift to save me possibly days of manual audio editing. All right, and Michael Teams has been generous enough to give my family and myself one gallon of pineapple coconut ice cream. Sounds like a wonderful way to end the year of live streams in celebration of that. Thank you, Michael. And it's always so wonderful to have your presence on the live streams. All right, so Renee just says, uh, follow up, Greg, about my Halion Sonic 7 user presets question. I was talking about the user button on the Halion Sonic uh, 7 right panel. Sorry about that. Let's see if we could take a look at it. Okay, so I'll just go and create a new preset here again real quick. Sorry for my misunderstanding on that. All right. So let me just see if we search here in the media bay for the one we created earlier. Okay, that shows up there. All right, let me see if I just come over here. and rescan the disks. All right, so we see it kind of listed there. Let's just jump back. Yeah, I think you, you would be able to see it once you see set the user here, but let me just See if we search.
right, let me see if there's... All right, so I think the first one we did was in... Yeah, I think that it would show up. I could play around with that. If you want to send me an email, Renee, uh, at clubcubase at steinberg.de, I could see if I could figure out why it's not showing up there. But I think it should. Um, but yeah, if you want to send me an email, sorry about my misunderstanding. All right, so we have a cube base checking in from Northern Canada, running Cubase 13 on Windows 11. Thanks for joining us, being part of the live stream today. All right, so David M asks, uh, Greg, how do I move VST instruments showing up in the wrong list in the VST plugin manager? Thanks. Okay, so let's say if we come to uh, the window, so we'll go to our studio menu, sorry, and let's go to our VST plugin manager. So sometimes some companies may not, you know, be as diligent about putting correct categories. So, you know, if you wanted to, so this will be kind of your default settings. Uh, and sometimes if you have like an instrument that's maybe miscategorized, um, if you click on the plus sign and say copy current collection, so we'll say this is, we'll call it David M. And now at this point, you can say, okay, I really want Howling and Sonic to be in the sampler category as opposed to this. Um, then you can just kind of drag and drop. Uh, and I don't think you could do that in the default categories because it's going to do it by category. So maybe just click here and then copy the current collection and then you can edit that collection as you see fit just by dragging it into different folders. So let me know if that's kind of what you're looking for, David. Okay. Always oh, wonderful to see Gareth Kitch on. I see Michael Teams granted him one gallon of banana uh, banana nut ice cream all right silver wolf asks uh hey greg is there a limit on the number of midi sends a midi track can go to for vsts so uh it's kind of set up the midi sends are set up for four so if you have a midi track here and on midi tracks as opposed to instrument tracks we could have sends and then as soon as we come over here we could route to up to four different destinations here. So, so it's a total of four for that. All right, so we have Alexander Plasco checking in from Connecticut. And, uh, wishing everyone a Merry Christmas. All right, and we have uh, Milosh Stoshik just saying, uh, hey, Greg, wish you mer Merry Christmas to you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to having a little bit of time off. All right, we see, always wonderful to see Michael Pierce on the live stream from Grand Chapel Studios outside of London. All right, so Cubase is asking if anyone's tried the Life plugin yet. So. All 
Okay, so we see uh, Emmanuel Morin uh, asks uh, Morin uh, asks from Quebec, uh, where can I see what Steinberg softwares and Cubase add-ons that request the dongle? So most, um, you know, if you wanted to see what's running, you know, so all the current versions are of the instruments. It sounds I think there's still a couple of third-party loop sets that are in the process, kind of the final steps of migrating. But we'll just say, okay, we just go to Google. It will say Steinberg software running on Steinberg licensing. And we could show you the list. This is the help file. So you can see kind of the older ones here are utilizing it, but let's um, but there's a list of all of the There's kind of a to see if there's but you could see if you kind of search there's usually a um, so these are kind of the older versions that are still so you can see Cubase 11 Dorco 3 uh, earlier groove agent versions but all the contemporary versions of these are all running on uh are all running on the e-licensor so it's very few programs so it's pretty much older versions at this point that are uh, but most of them have been updated the vast majority probably 97 percent I think Jazz Dude may have posted the link. Thank you for that. All right, so you see Nick has found the life plugin to be very a bit buggy, so I'll have to check it out. Reading through comments. Um, all right, so uh, Bradley Bishop asks, uh, "Hey, I run Cubase Pro 12. I was going to buy some loop sounds from Make Pop Music. Uh, is there anything I need to do to get them working, or is it just install and start using?" So, um, so when we do this, uh, you know, so if it's you know, probably there's a chance that it will just kind of show up. Um, you may have to like jump over here. So, you know, a lot of the content sets are sold, sold on the Steinberg website. You know, you can, this will have little icons to kind of indicate uh, exactly which particular uh, programs, uh, you know, like different families, and this will have all the metadata for uh, that Cubase needs to make it work with Project Rootkey and Tempos and stuff like that. 
uh, a lot of third-party content sets you may just have to access through your file browser and just say okay this is where my particular folder is and then if you wanted to right click on it you can say let's add to favorites and if you wanted to quickly navigate to it you could just go to your favorites and then you could see all of your different loops and access them directly from there so it may show up as where you may have to just access it through a file browser uh, so i'm not sure which exact loops and if they're kind of set with all the metadata for the steinberg programs Uh, so we see Kevin Mehmed says, uh, any going to Germany, Greg, in the future? So hopefully maybe, uh, you know, I have the NAM show coming up in January. So I'll be getting together with, with a, a few of the Stein, my Steinberg colleagues at that point. Um, but I did miss some meetings because my wife had a surgery in September. So I still have a ticket that's available. I just had to kind of coordinate calendars with everyone probably after Christmas to, so I could use my ticket and go meet up with everyone in Germany because I haven't been there in five years now or so. All right. All right, just reading through comments. All right. Um, all right. So we see a question from Larry B. Uh, hey, hi, Greg. When I'm in the channel strip, is there a simple click to open the full EQ or compressor used in the channel strip itself? So if you're accessing it from, it depends where you're accessing it from. So if you're in kind of, let's say the channel settings. So if we come here, let's just go to an audio track. That would be helpful. Um, and I'm in the channel strip you know, so if we have the compressor that we see here, if you click on the E at that point, you could see the particular uh, compressor that you're using. So if you had a tube compressor, you click on the edit channel settings, you could see kind of the full view directly there. Uh, if we go to the EQ, all you have to do is click on the EQ tab and you could just switch directly from the EQ tab to see the full EQ. So you're, um, but if you're doing it from, you know, but if you're doing it from the inspector, you know, so it, what you could do is um, you would just kind of see the little pop-up that we access here. And those would just open up the different kind of inspector GUIs, but they could still, if we wanted to run Let's say we go to the dynamics. If you want to see kind of the full, so let's say if we go to the compressor here, um, it's not going to open up this particular GUI from the uh, inspector tab from the channel strip. But if you're doing it from the channel editor, you could open up the compression, the compression and EQ plugins right from there. All right. Okay, so Michael Teams wants people to jingle bell that like button right now. Okay, so we see question. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and quickly post the Zoom meetup link again here. Which we do every half hour. And we'll be starting in just about an hour. Okay. Uh, so Keith Young asks, uh, Hello, Greg, QBase 13, Howling and Sonic 7. I load two instruments in two slots. I play the second one, and the first one plays two. Can I play them separately? Uh, thanks and happy Christmas. All right, so let's just go ahead. Let's do a brand new project. Okay, so let's say we have one instance of Howling in Sonic 7. Okay, so we'll come here. 
Let's get to our Halion Sonic. Okay, and we'll go to check out a sound from Taped Vibes, which is a free instrument to Steinberg released. Take advantage of that. All right. So I'll just, let's say we have kind of our Whirly here. And now if I want to load a different instrument, so let's say I want to load an organ on this, or let's just do maybe like synth. Okay, so right now I have this kind of playing the organ and playing the synth. So right now this is on MIDI channel one. And if I switch this to MIDI channel two, where this is, we get this synth. So now I go to MIDI channel one. I get the roads and we can see which MIDI channel these are on. And if I come here, because the track is on MIDI channel one, it's being sent to MIDI channel one. If I set my channel here to two, it now gets sent to the synth. And if these are layered together and you have one single instance, it could be that these are both on the same MIDI channel. So now if I want to layer, I could come over here. We'll put this onto channel one. And I could adjust the balance between these. And they'll both play together because they're both responding to MIDI channel one. But if this is set to two now so and if i double click here we could add a midi track now this midi track is routed since it's we've added it directly below an instrument track that this is the synth we go up the whirlitzer and if we want to play both at the same time or we could just simply so check to make sure that the midi channels aren't identical here. So when you look in the Halion Sonic, go to the MIDI tab and check the MIDI channels to make sure that they're not on the same if you're hearing both of them at the same time. All right, so it says you load up two instruments in two slots. I play the second one, and the first one plays two. Can I play them separately? Yeah, so I think you just need to, you know, perhaps add the MIDI track, and then, you know, make sure that they're on different MIDI channels. All right, uh, so Mickey's production asks, uh, Hey, Greg, can you show an example of how to create a macro for copy and paste? Uh, for instance, when I'm programming drum samples, um, Okay, so let's take a look. I'll just take a like a drum sample here. All right. Okay, so say I want to take this. Um, so I'm not sure if. Like how, you know, so we can copy. So if we want to do just a quick macro for copy and paste. Um, so we'll come over to macro or to our key commands. And I'm going to create a new macro. And we'll just call this and we'll see that we have it listed here. All right, so I'll just come over and we'll say copy. So I'm just gonna hit Command C here. So we'll just and we look. We'll have so 
So we'll just say copy. And then we'll go to paste. We'll add that command. Um, so I'm not sure, like, this may not work as a macro. So I could copy and paste um, to, like, a different location. So if I run the macro, we can copy and paste that. Um, but, you know, let me know if it's something that you want it to be, like, you know, to go to the next grid and paste it. Um, you know, because you could also just kind of come over here if you select kind of the range and then just hit Command D, we could duplicate. So if you want like a kick on beats one and three, uh, but that's how you could kind of make a macro for copy paste. Um, but let me know if there's like a specific thing with the drums that you want to do. Like if you want it to be placed, you know, if you need the 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 paste position to uh, to navigate to a specific time or beat later. Uh, I'd be happy to kind of go through that with the macro if we could do it. Okay, uh, so we see Club to Breathe joining us from Brazil. Thanks for being on. All right, um, so we see uh, Matrim Tube says, uh, hello, using Cubase 13 Artist, I tried via the MIDI insert transformer to drive expression with velocity for a plugin that does not take velocity. Um, so a lot of times, you know, we could think of expression. So let's see if, uh, so let's take a look. And see, you know, so I will, we'll see if we could get this going. So I'll just take an instrument track here. So I'll just take our Wurlitzer. Uh, let me just load up like maybe a string example. Might be this. Um, so let me know if you have a like a modulation wheel. Because that, that could work a lot better than just a velocity if you don't have like an expression. Um, but let's just go ahead and we'll go to Iconica Sketch, which is a great library that you get with Cubase 13. All right, so let's say we just want to go to um all right let's just do cello cello here so all right so let's say we have this on um like a sustain patch so a lot of times when you're dealing with you know with instruments that don't take velocity the idea is that when you have when you hold a note that you could adjust the dynamics of a note without having to re-trigger the note. So if I had velocity and I wanted one note to get louder, and you know, it's only going to take the initial velocity that's kind of tied to the MIDI note message. So if you don't have an expression pedal, most controllers will have a modulation wheel. So if you want it to come over to the expression, we'll go to our track and we can say, let's turn uh, like our modulation wheel into expression. So we'll just come over here and we'll open up the panel. And what we could do is we're going to just choose transform and we're going to say, let's take uh, type is equal to controller. And what we want to do to that, and we say, okay, I want this to be, um, we'll go to subtype and we'll say, let's go to our controller one. And what we want to do to that is we'll just take our subtype and we'll add 10 to it. So I could take modulation CC one and convert it into CC 11. So we'll come over here to, let's say, our MIDI inserts. 
And let's just open up a MIDI monitor. So when I, uh, we have this set up, I move my mod wheel. We can see that it's transmitting CC1 or CC11. I take it off and now it's doing CC1 in the MIDI monitor. So turn this on. But, you know, if we're doing velocity, uh, you know, a lot of times when you're using expression, um, so let's come over and switch this to, we want to do um, type is equal to note and oops, remove this and we want to take the velocity and we'll just say is bigger or inside range, say zero to 127. <clears throat> and we can come over to convert this to type to adjust to controller. And we want our subtype of the controller to be um, MIDI controller number we will set to fixed value and we'll say 11. So now as I play in note velocities, I could just take the note on and note off velocities and convert that into MIDI CC 11. And it could be that, you know, maybe the instrument doesn't take advantage of that because you know as we would play particular notes so you know we could set it up like that so now as i play notes it's going to take my velocity as the input for the midi cc 11 message so let me know if that's helpful but you know if you have a mod wheel you know, consider using the modulation wheel so that it you can change the values after the note was initially pressed. All right. Sorry, my chat field just jumped. <clears throat> All right, I think I'm back. Yeah, so we see Gareth and uh, Michael Teams want, want everyone to check out the Hot Mess Christmas songs. So it turned out quite well. All right, so we see um, maybe this is a part with the velocity, with the velocity question. It says, yes, I can succeed with the wheel, uh, but that way I can't use my two hands to play. So, you know, if your controller also has uh, after touch, you might be able to convert the after touch messages. So let's take a look at converting after touch into velocity. I think we could do that as well. Um, so we'll just go ahead and open up the panel here. So not every controller has aftertouch, but this way what you could do is say, I want to take uh, type is equal to controller. And we'll say type is going to be aftertouch. And then we want to convert uh, the aftertouch to And we'll say type is equal to controller. And let's make it controller is set to 
drawer 11. So now when I come over, so I could hit the notes and do after touch. So let's see if that is set up. Okay, we'll say set it to fixed value of controller. So I can get after touch and let's see if we could remove that. Okay, so we're transforming after touch into so um I think we should be able to like that should work but um but again a lot of times the you know you may not get the exact flavor you want from velocity for that so <clears throat> you see that gareth lives in avila city so all right and great to see william baker checking in from jamaica queens Stayed there many times, flying in and out of LaGuardia. All right, so we see um, from Mike uh, asks, uh, I have two issues. One, 90% of the time when I open up Cubase, I have to reset the audio outputs. Um, so sometimes, you know, if the audio interface isn't turned on, it will, uh, you know, it will prompt you, you know, to find an audio interface. So make one, make sure that your audio interface is set up. Certain operating systems, especially Mac OS, uh, like in, uh, if you had a HDMI cable connected, like for your display screen, that would trigger the prompt to automatically pop up for defining an audio interface because the Mac OS would want to automatically send, it would it would assume that you wanted to send all the audio down the HDMI cable to your display. Um, so that could cause problems that's been resolved in later Mac OS versions. Um, so one, you know, see if, if you're running Mac OS, it could be an issue that you need to update your Mac OS to resolve and to make sure that your audio interface is always turned on before starting compute before starting Cubase. And the second question is uh, during playback, if I click outside of Cubase or explore any of our program, Cubase loses focus and stops. So if I come here, what you want to do, um, I'll just, just jump back to a project here that we're on. All right, so let's say we're in this project. So probably what you need to do, let's say I was taking this. So go to your studio, menu to studio setup, go to audio system and click release driver when application is in the background. And then if I go to kind of like a web browser. So now you could kind of toggle. So try adjusting this setting. Um, so it could be that other programs are trying to take control of the audio interface. So now when I come over, I could go to my web browser and Cubase is still playing. Or if you wanted the audio driver to be released. So now if I want to give control of the audio interface to the other program. Now I'm back in Cubase, but with this turned on. With that turned off rather. Now I can go to a different program and my Cubase still plays. 
So again, go to Studio to Studio Setup and click the audio system and uncheck release driver when application is in the background. Okay, so we see Michael Pierce would may grace us with the end of year Christmas soup recipe. So All right, so we see um Honey from Beirut asks, uh, is it possible to change a track position from the mixing console and not from the project window? So currently we can't pick up a track here and drag it. It's going to only be done from the project window. I know it's a long standing request that people have had, um, but still hasn't materialized in Cubase yet. So you have to drag from the particular project window, then it's reflected in the mix console. Hopefully we'll see that come in the future. Okay, uh, Bradley Bishop asks, uh, when recording acoustic guitar, what range of dB do I want? So I think a lot of people may kind of aim for the peaks, like for tracking, maybe at like, you know, between minus 12 and minus 6 dB. So on the input stage, and that gives you a lot of, you know, gives you kind of a healthy gain structure into the system because you could always add gain very easily uh you know once the file is cleanly recorded so i would probably aim for around you know minus 12 minus 6 db for tracking all right so you see jazz dude has posted the link for Hot Mess Christmas song. So yeah, there's two different ones. All right. Wonderful to see Lawrence Koch checking in from uh, Rhode Island from Barn Door Recording. Glad you can make it today. All right. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, can you show um, how to trim head and tail an event using the alt bracket command? Is there a shortcut to trim an audio file event at beginning and ending transient points? Hope this makes sense. All right, so let's say if we want to you know, like trim head or tail. So let's say my cursor is here. Um, I think we could just, if we go to edit, I think it's under range. We could just say cut head. And let's say if we jump here, we could say cut tail. So let's say we go to range, cut tail. So we could do it like that. And if we want it to maybe do it as part of a macro, so let's say if we come here and I have my range set, um, I could probably just, just create a macro. Um, so if you, you know, if you have like the left and right locator set, another way you could do with like the, if you have the range tool active, it's just kind of come over here and choose range crop and that will automatically, uh, just kind of, you know, crop out what was the beginning and end. So even if we wanted to, um, let's say if we have, and that could be based upon a preference where we go to editing, we could say, Cycle follows range selection. So I think that, let's, let's see if we have that set. And I have my range here. No, it doesn't. Um, but if you have that particular preference open, you could just come here and go to edit and crop under the range. And so you could just 
do that and that will cut head and cut tail but you're kind of setting the range that you want with the range tool all right um so we see uh is there a shortcut to trim an audio file at the beginning and ending transient points hope this makes sense so if depending on the file itself so let's i'll take just a smaller file here so let's say I just, we'll take so let's say I'll just take so I don't think it will automatically go to the transient but in 13 so let's come over here I'll just crop this and we'll make it smaller um, if I have the range tool selected here um, there there are functions so it's not to the last transient point but if we go to select we can say enlarge range to next hit point and that will and i'll just kind of set uh keyboard shortcuts here on my midi remote for that so i'll just say let's go So we'll say to previous hit point here. So I'll assign that particular function. And for this one, I wanted to go to to next hit point. All right, so now if we wanted to like easily extend the range kind of based on hit points, it's not gonna necessarily go to the last hit point but you could just choose to uh to navigate you know the selected range based on the hit points and you could go to the last hit point or to the first hit point just like that within the wav file and then choose to crop but there isn't a way to say go to the last transient that i know of all right so i'm going to paste the Zoom meetup. We're going to be doing that in about 30 minutes. All right, so we see uh, from Mickey's Productions. Uh, hey, Greg, when using the chord track with chords, uh, can you change the scale of the chord track? Uh, and how can you also change the chords to reflect the scale change? All right, so let's come over here. Let's just jump to project here. It has some chords in it. So I don't think that there is a automatically um so if we have our chords here so say we have a chord progression so if we want to take our particular scale so say okay we're in g major um i think if we click here we could let's see if we could if it's Okay, so if I take off automatic scales, at this point we can say, okay, I want to go to G harmonic minor. Um, and then, so we could set the scale there. So instead of setting automatic scales, um, and then I think if we come here, we could say, I think that would not necessarily maintain it within the key, but you could say, okay, I want uh, G I'll just, uh, let's say we want to, like I wanted these particular chords to be minor. Um, so there isn't a way to, we could transpose kind of up and down so we could set our root key to go for all of the chords. Um, but it, if we s change the scale, we may have to manually kind of change the chords. 
like that. So uh, because we don't want it to be limited to only working on chords, um, you know, it's perfectly fine. You know, like I was just teaching my son Sir Duke on bass, you know, and when you go from like, you know, B minor and all of a sudden you have an F, you know, you go from B major uh, tonality and then, you know, Stevie throws in an F minor chord, you know, which is like one of those chords you would never think to do in B major, but it works incredibly well. At that point, you know, it, uh, you know, we don't want to restrict you to only playing chords within the diatonic scales because, you know, obviously many songs that don't comply with that. All right, so we see a uh, question. Is there a way to prevent Cubase uh, not to scan VST plugins at program start? It's taking a lot of time and wait. So a lot of times, if it's taking a long time, it usually takes a bit longer the very first time because it's you know testing the latency of each plugin. It's also doing a quick kind of stability test on the particular plugins to make sure that they shouldn't be blocked for system integrity purposes. Um, but I have on my personal PC, my personal studio computer, I have like, you know, 250 plugins and it goes through all the plugins, um, you know, in two or three seconds, if that. So it could be that there's particular plugins that are causing the hang up and, you know, so if you have plugins that are in a block list that maybe you reactivate, it's going to go through and retest those plugins. But there isn't a way to do that, and that way you, you can be assured that all the plugins that you're going to use in the session will be working. All right. All right, so we see Michael Pierce is sharing his soup recipe. Uh, diced onions, sweet diced carrot, and celery. Um, Wet, feeling dangerous, add, add curry paste and sweat it off. Um, so honey carrots, bring them in. Brussels sprouts, bung them in. Roast parsnips and potatoes and bread sauce and gravy. Top up with stock, warm up for 20 minutes. All right, so we see uh, Hani says, I would like to have a mastering session in Cubase, the same like the one in Studio One. So, you know, we do make a dedicated, you know, very high-end mastering solution called WaveLab. So, you know, we do have like, you know, a really, you know, like the kind of the industry standard mastering program in WaveLab that we also do. So I'm not sure if we would take the WaveLab functionality and put it in Cubase because, you know, it's, you know, really different workflows, but you could, if you have both programs, you could work with those together. All right, so we see from Patricia, uh, hi Greg, how can I use MIDI modifiers in Cubase to adjust a cutoff parameter based on velocity? So a lot of times this will be just kind of based on the actual instrument itself. So let's say if I want to come over to Retrolog. Um, so let's just come over and find. Okay, so. So, you know, generally it's going to be like how the instrument actually responds to it. So let's say. All right, so I have this. I'm going to adjust the envelope here. And then we could have the filter envelope below. So you can say for velocity that. So as we have like less velocity here. So lower velocities, higher velocities, we could open up the filter. And you could adjust kind of the amount of how much of that envelope is. All 
So I don't think you need the MIDI modifiers for that, but it's how the instrument is going to respond to it. So again, just kind of come over here. So, okay, let's... And all that changes just by velocity. So let me know if that's what you want to kind of achieve, Patricia. All right, so uh, Rich B asks, uh, is it possible to use note expression with Groove Agent? Uh, for example, I would like to use it to manipulate the tuning of a hi-hat or a snare. So I don't think you need note expression for that because um, what you could do is just manipulate it within the particular instrument. So let's say if we want to go to here and I want to take the hi-hats. So say I want to take that. Um, so I could just select this particular pad and go to the pitch envelope. And if I wanted to just randomize the pitch, or if I want to do, you know, coarse tuning. So it's not tuning anything else except for And then even if we wanted to do kind of like a, an envelope, we could adjust our envelope amount. fine tuning or again random as well so let me know if you feel you need to do note expression on it or you could just do it kind of with the samples inside of uh, groove agent and if we wanted to do this also for um, you know to, let's say more of an acoustic agent kit we can come over here so let's say we play and I just want to take the snare here we could just adjust like our snare volume. And if I wanted to just right click, learn MIDI CC, I could just use like my modulation wheel and just kind of do my tuning just like that. So let me know if that makes sense for, your, for kind of what you want to do with the workflow. All right, so we see from uh, Kai Wen Franklin. Uh, Hi, Greg, can you give me some tips on using side chaining? I usually use it on my bass tracks, and that is it. I see Cubase has side chain built into some of the effects. You know, so if you wanted to do side chaining on delays, is a pretty common thing. So you know, if you wanted to have one source, you know, so that when the when the delay is kind of uh, kicks in, that the delay itself. So let's say I will come over here. Let's take a vocal. Um, so you know, if you wanted to do side chaining on, um, you know, so doing like a delay side chain, or if you have the, I will take this. Let's go to. Um, uh, let's go to the multi-tap delay and here we could have just a particular uh, I want to do let's say eighth note delay all right but in here we could also do just a quick ducking so we could say uh, let me just okay so remember Okay, so now we could just come over here to our ducker. So while it's playing, you could do kind of stuff like this as well. So the delay doesn't really kick in until the vocal stops. Started losing sight. 
So you could kind of adjust how much is being kind of ducked as well. So a lot of people will use it for ducking, stuff like that. You know, I've seen some people like in when doing like a big like 80s hard rock thing would take everything, uh, would have like, you know, a group with the snare drum. So when the snare hits, everything, you know, goes down within the group. If you want to do side chaining on, you know, individual uh, effects when utilizing, you know, a creative tool like the FX modulator um, here, because, you know, each of the bands could have their own side chain input. So if we just come over here and say, okay, I want, you know, pitch change. So say if we go to module and I want a pitch shifter, and now we could activate uh, different triggers for this where you can say you know have your side chain sources for different effects so you can do a lot of creative stuff with side chaining like that All right. Okay, sorry, my chat field just jumped on me. Um, all right, so um, Cubase asks, uh, hi, Greg, can you please demonstrate visually the phase relationship and time alignment for drums from your perspective? Thanks. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, let's move some drums out of phase. So if we have like a multi-track drum recording. All right, so let's say we'll come over and let's listen to maybe our kicks here. We'll open up Supervision and let's look at um, All right, so we have kind of our phase correlation there. All right, so let's say we will come over and let's look at just our phase scope. Oh, sorry. Let's just make this into our multi-correlation. And I will just kind of flip the phase on one of these tracks here. So we'll go to pre-section so let's see if we I'll show it on acoustic guitar track this is always kind of a good way to visualize it um, all right so let's say I want to take these two guitar track I'm gonna take these tracks here and let's go ahead and knock one out of phase. I'm gonna convert tracks. Okay. So let's say we have these two. So I'll go ahead and flip the phase. So we get here out like those frequencies are kind of canceling out each other so we could see this visually when we see our phase meter kind of go very horizontal and we see that these are showing the particular frequencies that are not out of phase mm -hmm. 
And even if I wanted to, or we'll rightfully call that polarity. Okay, so for I know Michael Team's like, God, oh, Greg, you're an idiot. All right, but let's say if we zoom in greatly here, just to kind of show the waveforms, and we'll we'll kind of flip the polarity a di in a different way. All right, so let's say we zoom in here so we can see that when this waveform is going up, this one is going up. So they're pretty much kind of mirroring each other. And then I could invert the polarity here so that when we stop, when this one is going up, this one is going down. So if we just invert the polarity right there, we could see that when it's inverted, that the waveforms are going in opposite directions. And now when I flip the inversion of the polarity we can see that everything is nice and happy and copacetic with that all right i know i had a couple questions that were mailed in let me get to those all right let me just jump over all right um and we had this question from last time, and I couldn't find my macro. It says, uh, can a macro be created to trim MIDI event lengths to the included notes? Okay, so let's say I have a MIDI event. And I have notes here, but not at the start or the beginning of the event. So I made, um, I think it's a project logical editor, or it's a macro. So we'll come over to my macros and key commands. And we'll show the, All right. All right, let's just see if I can. Could... Okay, so here we go. Size MIDI events to note lengths. All right, so the first thing is I made a um, a logical editor preset. So I didn't want to have to have the particular MIDI editor open at all times. So I made a logical editor preset for selecting uh, select notes. So we just said select type is equal to notes. Um, so we have that. So uh, what we're going to do is choose editors. We're going to open the key editor in the background. We're going to select all the notes with the project logical with the logical editor rather preset that we just made. And we're going to say transport locators to selection. That's going to move the left and right locators based upon the selection. And then we're going to close the MIDI key editor. We're going to then choose to do edit split loop. And then there's a, uh, a project logical editor preset that comes with the program called delete empty parts. And I'll just show that. And that's basically coming over here to we'll go to our project menu to project logical editor to set up and it's one of the factory presets and I think we go to uh, parts and events we can see delete empty MIDI and audio events so so we've now coupled this all into a particular macro so let's say as we want to run the macro what we want is to have the event lengths start at the beginning of the note and end at the last note off message or of the particular note. So I run this macro now, it'll just automatically trim that particular MIDI event. So again, make a logical editor preset for select notes, and there may be one in there already. Open the key editor, 
process, select all the notes, set the left and right locators, close the key editor, so open close editor, split the loop, and that will cut that, and then we'll delete the empty parts. So again, now we see that we have MIDI, you know, at the beginning and at the end there. So I can just now say trim based upon the MIDI note lengths. All right, so we had a question. Um, does choosing defaults in the preference reset all defaults or only on the active preference page? Okay, so, um, so let's say we go to the preferences. You know, later Mac OS versions may be set to settings. Uh, but if I come over here to a particular preference, so let's say I was uh, playing around with color schemes and let's say, okay, I want to take my focus color. I want it to be, you know, yellow instead. And now I want to come over here to my record MIDI and I want to record enable, I want these two steps to be off. So now I go to my color schemes, and if I want to set this to the defaults, that now we could come over and set, you know, our defaults for this particular page. So we say, okay, let's go to our defaults. But when I go to my record MIDI, that those were still preserved. So when we click on the defaults, it'll set the defaults for the active page, not all of the preferences. All right, uh, so we had a question. Hey, Greg, I'm using a third-party VST, and there's a knob I'm trying to adjust the automation for. It works in percentages from minus 100 to 100%. It's very inconsistent, and when trying to enter values, it doesn't quite input the percentage from the info line, especially during playback. I'm wondering if there's a way to enter a static value at the start of each note, i.e. minus 42, 24, 63%. Um, and also, is there a way to switch it from percent to a zero to 127 value? So a lot of times when we're dealing with automation for a particular parameter on a plugin, so let's say we jump back over to here. So let's say uh, I go to this and let's open up just a quick plugin parameter. Um, let's come over to our FX modulator. I might be able to get something here. So let's say we do uh, pitch shifter. Okay, so now that I automate a particular parameter, um, I'll just set this to reveal the parameters. on right okay so i'm going to automate this all right so you know our values that we often see going on um will be all right so just oh i'm sorry just come over here All right, so when we go to different parameters, so, you know, how the automation in Cubase is going to work, you know, is, you know, the plugin parameters can be kind of arbitrary and how it's kind of defined by the, you know, particular value. So when we go to enter in values, you know, if it's going to be, let's say, um, you know, like a, different values so I'll just come over and say we'll go to our inserts to FX modulator and we'll say effects pitch shifter or we'll, we could do pan so let's say we want to do um, and smooth so you know if we go to enter in different values you know these values are going to be kind of set up you know in percentages to what the maximum 
and total, you know, within the scale of their parameters. So it's not going to necess the plugin doesn't report, you know, the scale that's used within the plugin for the particular event because under the hood, it's just doing this percentage and, you know, the plugins don't report that this should be set to minus 100 to plus 100 or, you know, zero to 127. So if it's not like an automation value, it's just going to be dealing with percentages and the plugin will, that's what the plugin is transmitting and receiving as opposed to the particular, and how it's displayed is going to be independent of what's going on in the code for the particular plugin. All right, so we have a question. Um, is there a way I can have a randomized color for each lanes as I find it easier to comp for my ADH brain? I have to color each lane manually now, but is there a preference setting or logical editor setting that I can use? All right, so let's take a quick look. Um, so there's no kind of randomized colors function that I, I found in the uh, editors. So let me see if I have this in my, but we'll take a quick look. So let's say if we have our lanes open, so I think that what we could do is there's a project logical editor. Um, so I just made a quick preset. So let's come over here and I think it's just like increment colors. All right, so now if we have like this particular track set up, I can come over here, hit apply. So I, I don't think that this is going to work for lanes. Let me just, um, yeah, so the lanes I think still had to be, you know, we could do this for like the individual colors, the individual tracks, but the lanes I think will still have to be manually colored, but you could just kind of come over, you know, and say, okay, this lane I, I want, I think if we just even come over here and change colors for the, for the selected lane that we could do that as well. So, but there's no kind of automatic way to, randomize the colors for lanes all right um so we have a question uh do you have any ideas on how to sync cubase pro to simpty not midi timecode uh in the project synchronization setup dialog there's a button for asio audio device but it's grayed out and inaccessible uh the thing is i have a couple of simpty code stripped striped analog 24 track tapes that hasn't been touched in about 30 years i'd like to digitize these I also have the original Cubase song files. We'll sort of transcode it to CPR files. In my mind, I should be able to set SMPTE, the SMPTE code on the tape as an input of the audio interface and have Cubase sync to this. The inclusion of ASIO audio device is a source option, implies this as well. How do I activate this? So when we go to our project synchronization setup, we'll go to transport and we'll say our project sync setup. And as we come over here, you can see ASIO audio devices. So some audio devices will have, you know, as part of the audio interface, like ADAT sync. And that's what that is set up for. If you wanted to take the time code and have Cubase synchronized to that, you could, the most common method is to take a hardware box to take the incoming SMPT time code, convert it to MIDI time code that gets sent to the computer that Cubase can follow the MIDI source and the audio interface would need to be clocked from the synchronizer box. Um, if you had like a time, if you have like a Nuendo sync station, you could take the incoming time code and select VST system link and that will do the synchronization via VST system link. But there's no way just to feed SMPTE timecode into an audio input and have Cubase resolved to that. 
All right, so I know that we're just out of time. Let's go ahead and start our Zoom meetup. Let me jump back to the chat and I'll post the Zoom link and we'll migrate over to the Zoom setup. So give me just one second and I'll post in the chat. Thank you for all the question, all the great questions. And again, uh, we'll migrate over to the Zoom meeting. I'll get that started. And then uh, again, we won't have uh, live streams next week. We will be meeting up uh, starting January 2nd on a Tuesday. So let's go ahead and start the Zoom. Sorry for being a minute or two late. All right. Are people migrating over? All right, and we have, let's just start admitting people here. Seems like the link is working okay today. We see Michael Pierce on. We have Nick joining us. John Costigan. All right, we have Michael Teams. All right. And we'll just, I'll let the, uh, the zoo, we'll keep the live stream open just for a minute. I'll show, let's see if I could show the meeting invitation. I think, I think Joe Hen, Henry, Henry, we could hear your audio coming through. All right, we see, all right, we see Jan from Stockholm. Great to see you, Jan. Great to see you, everyone. Okay. All right, and we have Ash Rebel Hand Studios on. Great to see you from Australia. Good. All right, I'm gonna shut down the live stream in just a minute. We'll get started on our Zoom meetup. All right, so I'm going to end the live stream here and then we'll migrate over to the Zoom. Let's end stream.